How you doing? Hey, good. How are you? Good. It's it's been a while. Yeah, a couple months, huh? Yeah, it has been a couple months. It's uh a lot has changed, eh, over the last couple of months. So, yeah, lots of yeah, so I've got uh, so many questions here. So I got to get started. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I know you're busy. So uh, let's talk about the new variants, if you don't mind. Uh, what do you think these new uh, UK and uh, South African variants, and should we be worried? Yeah, you know, this has obviously been a big talk uh, on the news and everything for the last uh, several weeks. And I think that uh, the variants that have two main things that we are concerned about. Uh, the first one is that they might be more, not they might be, they are more transmissible. So that okay. can obviously mean we have more cases, it can happen more quickly. And the second thing we see, especially with the Brazil one, is that there might be some resistance to the vaccine. So the vaccine would still work, but just not as well. So I think that this is one of the things that we're all concerned about. But when you look at it, we still know that the, the things that we do, the tried and true principles of public health, indoor masking, physical distancing, washing our hands, keeping our groups small, indoor ventilation, all these things still work to decrease the transmission. And we really have to just do those things well. I don't think we really need to re reinvent the wheel. But other big thing that's big for us here in, in uh, Mississauga and the Peel region in general is essential services, factories, food processing plants. We really need to look at these areas and beef up these public health protocols. And I do think that we can get this under control. Cool. Um, you're, you're talking about how this is more transmittable, the, uh, the, the new variants. Uh, should people be double masking uh, if this is the case? Yeah, you know, this was a big thing when uh, Dr. Fauci from uh, CDC mentioned this last week. And, you know, I think the big thing is that we didn't see afterwards. He actually uh, kind of walked that back a bit in a video just this week. Uh, so I think the main thing for us, if you want to wear two masks, no one's going to shame you. You can do it. But I think what's more important for us is to remember, we want to wear a mask that you actually wear properly. Okay, that's one of the big things. And wear a mask that you know has layers in it. Or if you can get your hands on a medical mask, that works too. But the mask only works as well as if you wear it properly. And I think that's more important than wearing the two masks. And of course, remember, a mask is not a, a bit of armor against COVID-19. You really want to do all the other things well, including physical distancing and, of course, uh, ventilation. You don't want to be in a small room with a whole bunch of people for a long period of time, even if you are masked. You want, you want to avoid that. And I think that uh, those things will work just as well for the variants or the, the, the wild type virus, the regular virus. Uh, the new variant uh, that was found in Peel and in a lot of the places in Ontario, uh, there doesn't seem to be any travel history. Is it possible the variant can actually start anywhere like I, we call it the uk and the south african but can it not start anywhere yeah well, these particular variants we know that if, if you kind of do the uh analysis on them they are the ones that came from these areas of the world but you're absolutely right anywhere the virus is really multiplying and spreading around you can get a new variant arise because that's how mutations happen as the virus um uh, copies itself so, you know, there probably are tons of variants around the world, but the vast majority of them really don't make much of a difference. It's like, you know, having a hat that's red, you change it, you now put on a blue one. You haven't changed the behavior of the person, you just change the way it looks. Uh, but that said, um, I think it's important, regardless of what we do, these variants are going to happen. And it's really important for us to get vaccines into Canadians' arms and also like, not take uh, our sight away from the tried and true uh, public health principles to help keep this uh, COVID uh, outbreak under control. Uh, last time I talked to you, uh, we were even talking, we were talking about vaccines and I, I kept on asking, when are they coming? When are they yeah. coming? They're here now. Well, I mean, they're tri trickling in, but they're created. Um, so now I have a whole bunch of vaccine questions for you. Of so course, go ahead. how long, um, how long do you, can you wait in between shots? Because you hear kind of like, I heard Quebec is doing up to 90 days you know, in between shots. And then you hear uh, Dr. Fauci say, uh, well, we only have information up to 28 days. So what, do, what are your thoughts? If you go by the trial, you know, the, the trial shows three weeks for Pfizer, for example, and, 28, and four weeks for um, Moderna. But those things are somewhat arbitrary. If you look at other vaccines, I'll give you a great example, hepatitis A. It's a vaccine that you can get one, you're supposed to do it minimum about nine months later, but sometimes it can be a year, it can be a two years. Now I'm not saying to wait that long between the vaccines, but it is something we know in immunology, in vaccine immunology, is that if you spread the vaccine out, it's not going to necessarily decrease its efficacy. You want to do that within reason. So I think that we do know that, let's say if you wait for a month, if you wait for a couple of months, it's not going to make a big difference as long as you get both doses of the vaccine. And here's another interesting thing. 
we're seeing some trials happening in England where they're actually mixing vaccines. So maybe you get the first dose of AstraZeneca and the second dose of Pfizer. These things actually might be very helpful in the future if we really want to know these things. But I think that as long as we get vaccinated, that's the important. Interesting. Um, uh, full immunity. Uh, how long does it take for f full immunity once you get the first or second shot? So if you look at the trials, let's say I know the trial is the best the evidence that we have right now is for Pfizer and Moderna. Generally, even after the first dose of vaccine, 10 days later, you're showing some signs of immunity. And in general, you can say roughly two weeks after the completion of the, of the, the regimen, so after the second shot, you're now protected to the, the uh, maximum effect that you will be. So uh, it doesn't happen immediately afterwards, but generally within about a week or two, you're fully protected. Okay. Uh, and uh, what is the percentage of the population that has to be vaccinated for this herd immunity to kick in? This is a huge thing. I'm going to actually say something that you guys might not have heard before, is that, you know, we talked about this estimate of 70%, right? Or even I've even heard as high as 80%, but I don't think that's necessarily true. First of all, we don't have to completely get rid of the virus. We never will. This is like a respiratory virus. It's going to be something that's with us to stay, but something that's probably going to be seasonal, like influenza or the, the common cold virus. So the other thing is that we know that not everybody spreads the virus equally. You'll see that one person is often resulting in several infections, and then many other people don't uh, result in infections. So when you're looking at that, it might be actually substantially lower than 80%. The big thing for us is as long as we get the highest risk people vaccinated first, for example, people in long-term care, older individuals, people with things like diabetes and immune compromise, if you get that population first, we might be able to get the stress off the healthcare system. We have now the ability to um, uh, adjust that people do come into hospital and we can actually start to open up businesses. So I think that even though we look at 80%, it might actually be a lot earlier than that. And my guess is that by the time we're, we're rolling into summertime, things are going to be looking a lot better than they do right now. Um, I heard even after taking the vaccine, uh, people can still, I guess, spread or transmit COVID if, to the person that doesn't have a vaccine or has taken the vaccine shot. Is that true? It, it is possibly true. What we are seeing, though, we do know that if somebody gets the vaccine, the risk of them having symptomatic disease, or so disease, for example, you're coughing and have fever, and that being converted to asymptomatic disease, at least, is very, very, is very, very effective at doing that. We also know that people that don't show symptoms at any point with COVID don't transmit as effectively as somebody who is, for example, coughing or having a lot of fever. So I think that even if we do have the ability to spread the virus after you had the vaccine, it's to a much lower level uh, to, compared to if you didn't have the vaccine. So I think that by the time we get in the summertime and lots of people have been vaccinated, we're going to break those transmission chains and it's not going to be spreading as rampantly as it is right now. Um, and what do you have to say to those darn anti-vaxxers? Yeah, anti-vaxxers are an issue, but here's one thing that I think is important. There are people who are labeled as anti-vaxxers where they're actually more just vaccine hesitant. They want to know a bit more, right? Hey, when I heard about Moderna, I was thinking about it back in like June when we were all still worried about the, the, uh, the outbreak. We were hearing about this then. I was, you know, I want to know a bit more. And I think that's the big thing. Find out why somebody is vaccine hesitant. Talk to them, have a conversation. And lots of people after you've talked to them are not actually anti-vaxxer. But yep, you're right. There is that small proportion of people that no matter how much you uh, tell them, no matter how much information you give, they're not going to want to give back, get vaccinated. And listen, I don't think it's, I'll give my, uh, uh, my opinion of what you really should be doing, but in the end, I can't force anybody. And my goal is to get the right information out to as many people as possible. And I think the, for the most part, even those people who are vaccine hesitant will end up getting it. I'll take back the darn. Um, are there any long-term effects to uh, COVID-19? You know, there can be. And we have been seeing a lot of, of talk on long haulers, you know, people that are six months later, they're still feeling really tired. Uh, people who have had strokes or clots in their lungs. These things can certainly happen, but I will stress that the vast majority of people who have COVID have no long-term effects. Uh, this said, I think uh, the best thing is prevention. This is why the vaccine is going to be very, very important going forward. But I do want to mention that for the most part, people that get the vaccine, even if you've seen studies that people are still having symptoms, you know, 20% of people still having symptoms 60 weeks, uh, six uh, months later, those studies are often, uh, uh, they're kind of like uh, skewed towards people who have had a bad course of disease. 
But for the most part, people have mild symptoms. They get better. But we have a weapon, and that's uh, the vaccine. Let's get that vaccine into as many arms as we can. Um, I know in Peel, uh, workplace outbreaks are a huge, huge deal. Um, do you think in Peel, do you, do you think they should name these places? Uh, just, I, and I say this because, I mean, I don't think contact tracing is possible anymore, right? So fully. So do you think these places should be named? Yeah, you know, I, I've, uh, I've kind of gone back and forth. And I understand why, you know, people might want to, uh, you know, keep the privacy of the people. At the same time, there is a, a public benefit to knowing where there is. I, I'm on the, the side that I think that the places uh, should be named, but in a way that you're not doing it as a blame thing. You, you kind of showing, look, this is, these are the areas of the, uh, the sectors of workplaces that we're seeing outbreaks in. In Peel, we have one of the largest numbers of essential workplaces in the entire country, factories, uh, Amazon warehouse, um, uh, food processing plants. And these are areas that the lockdown does not actually address. And that's why I think it's really important to, uh, whether or not we name that we really, really want to put our efforts into making these places as safe as possible, paid sick leave to help people so they're actually going to get tested and they're not afraid of losing money if they have to go um, uh, off on sick leave. And of course, the big thing is you've heard of these isolation centers. Many people that get sick at workplaces then can bring it home to a family that sometimes can be up to 10 people, if not more. So if you have isolation centers like we have in Peel region, you can give people the, the opportunity to um, isolate away from their family. You break the transmission chain. And we can keep bringing numbers down. Uh, us in the media, we always see the numbers, the, you know, the, the COVID-19 numbers as a whole. Uh, we, see, we see the numbers going down, the COVID-19 numbers, but we don't see the death rate going down as fast. Why is that? Yeah, a part of the reason for that is that we remember that the people who get COVID, many of them who get sick with it don't die right away if they're going to get severe illness. There's many people that languish on a ventilator for several weeks. So people are in a hospital for several weeks, and then later on, they end up uh, unfortunately dying. And oftentimes, these are our most vulnerable patients, people that are in long-term care, people who are older, uh, people who have uh, chronic diseases. So what you're often seeing is that the numbers go down in the community, but the hospitalizations will stay stable while uh, many people who have been in hospital for a long time and uh, unfortunately die, this will come, back, come down later on. But our biggest goal, of course, is to get vulnerable people vaccinated, keep those numbers low in the community. And I think we're going to get out of this. The summer is going to be looking a lot better than it is right now. Good. Um, I'm half Japanese and I'm always talking to my friends in Japan and they're talking about third wave already. Is it, are we going to get hit with a third wave in Canada? Yeah, you know, that's definitely something we have to think about. Now, I don't think the third wave is going to be like the second wave. You have to remember that in, in comparison to all the waves that we've seen, we have two big things that are working for us in the Northern Hemisphere. Number one, we have the uh, warmer weather coming up. We're going to, on average, have less people inside. So that's going to decrease the amount of transmission. And of course, the vaccine. The vaccine may not be perfect, but it's going to make a huge dent in, in, these, uh, in these cases. So I think that the other thing to remember is that uh, as more vulnerable people are vaccinated, it's not going to matter as much if people are getting, uh, getting the virus because the thing is, it's going to not be something severe. You're going to get a sore throat, maybe some sniffles, and you don't get hospitalized, which is one of our biggest things to worry about. Uh, I think, again, things are going to be a lot different in the summertime. The numbers may be there, but the vast majority of people getting it who are vaccinated are just going to have a mild, uh, you know, uh, sniffles and be okay with it. And that's what is going to happen with COVID-19 going forward. It's not going to be a severe disease as long as we get that vaccine into people's arms. Okay. Uh, COVID-19, is it going to be with us forever like the flu? Yeah, I, I think that's a good bet. Now, of course, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Maybe I will be wrong. But uh, what most of the experts are looking at, this is going to be a seasonal virus. But we have to remember that right now we're seeing tons and tons of cases. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be more like, you know, like influenza. During the wintertime, we see spikes of it. The hospital does have a bit of stress, but not like it is right now where, you know, we're having to close down things in the community to slow down transmission. It's going to be something that we can handle. And again, that's why the vaccine is such a big part of this. And I think lots of people are going to be wearing masks going forwards. But, you know, I think the big thing I want people to know, and even though it's going to be with us, I don't think these burdensome lockdowns are going to be with us in the future. Thank goodness. Um, couple more, uh, five more questions left. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, one of our viewers is curious to know why COVID tests administered at hospitals for symptomatic people go deeper than pharmacies uh, administering tests that don't go as deep. 
Yeah, I've had six of those tests, and sometimes it feels like it goes right, yeah. right, right to the back inside your brain. But yeah, it, it's partially because it depends on what test they're using. To be honest with you, I'm not completely familiar with the exact test that different pharmacies use. Okay. The ones in the hospitals, we use the nasopharyngeal, so that's the one that's the very, very back. But the ones in the the shoppers drug mart might be using the nasal tests, which are much more comfortable, and they're kind of more in the front part of the nose. That's probably the difference why. Okay. Uh, another one we have uh, are break rooms in hospitals and long term cares long term care centers likely to cause outbreaks when they're happening in hospitals and long term care. I guess um, are they going to transmit the in the in the, the break rooms? Yeah. I apologize for the noise there. Just an announcement on the hospital. No, no, no. Absolutely right. Like I mean, you know, when we look at contact tracing, uh, oftentimes where people are uh, picking up the virus when uh, workers spread it to each other are in areas where people are sitting together with their masks off, doing things like eating, having coffee, and talking. So we often do concentrate on break rooms and other common areas and try to make those as safe as possible. It is possible to eat safely um, with other people, but you want to minimize the number of people in the room maximize the distance and also minimize the time that you're spending together because we do know that even sometimes if you are sitting say 10 meters apart but you're in a small room for a prolonged period of time you can transmit the virus and that's why it's important for us to uh, keep all these principles in mind uh schools are opening up february 16th in uh, peel in toronto um do you think it's too soon based on kind of like you know in september we were doing good and then all of a sudden the schools open boom you know the cases went up uh I, i'm sure it's a lot different now but do you think it's too soon for the schools to open up no and i think that we really have to look at the, the benefits and the risks of closing schools i think the one thing that we do know obviously things can change right but we do know that schools the protocol that they had in place even though they're not perfect they did a really, really good job of keeping transmission chains from going out of control there. So you'll see kids, yeah, the occasional kid would get um, COVID-19, but they weren't passing it to a ton of people in the class. And one thing that we definitely do know is that schools aren't driving the cases in the community. So I, I think the big thing also we have to look at is the risks of having kids out of school. Kids need school for development, for learning, for seeing their, their friends, you know, and, and kind of just developing school is such an important part of that. I think right now is the right time for kids to go back to school, you know, to keep, uh, keep the community transmission as low as possible. And I think that right now there are going to be cases, but it's not going to be something that makes the, uh, the community transmission explode. And uh, the million dollar question is, when do you think the, the economy is going to open back up? When do you think this lockdown is going to be lifted? Like when, when I mean, you, you don't know, but I mean, like, when do you think it should? <laughs> Yeah, I wish we could do it today. But I think the, the big thing for us to remember is that as vaccination rolls out and people aren't getting severely ill with COVID, that's going to depressurize the hospital system. And that's going to be people. I don't want anybody to get sick, severely sick from COVID. But the thing is, if people do get sick, we at least have the uh, capacity to deal with that. So that's number one. And number two, I do think that we can start to open up uh, low risk things right now. Let's start opening up small businesses that have their uh, protocols in place. Let's start opening up things like tennis. I'm a tennis fan, but I mean, okay. things where you, you can, you know, uh, have a workout, but you're doing uh, uh, things to keep people apart, right? You probably don't want to open up things that are higher risk. And you definitely don't want to open up things like, you know, concerts right now. But if we do this slowly, we do it properly and deliberately. I think we can do it safely. Just remembering that as the vaccine starts to get out to more and more vulnerable people, you're not going to have as many people getting severely ill. And that is the main part with COVID that, we, that uh, was causing problems before. Uh, and Dr. Chakrabarty, the most important question of all is, are you a Super Bowl watcher, the weekend watcher, or the commercial watcher? What are you looking forward to the most? I, I'm not the biggest uh, football fan. I am a Super Bowl fan. I do watch it. I, I'm a commercial watcher as well. Uh, but yeah, like, listen, uh, we have an awesome event coming up this weekend, but we are still in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, we have to remember that you don't have to have a big party to, to pass COVID. You can pass it even in just, you know, 10 people watching TV. So I really urge people, uh, if you're going to uh, watch the Super Bowl, keep it with your household. Uh, keep things, if you are going to have a couple of people over, which we shouldn't be doing really, but you want to be able to kind of uh, do it safely. Uh, minimal number of people, masks indoors if there's people that aren't in your household. And remember that we want to keep the ventilation as good as possible. But uh, this is the year. We're going to have plenty of other years in the future to have a, a big party. This is not the year to be having it. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Order from your local restaurants to support small businesses. I think we can have a really, really different Super Bowl this year and a good one. Next year, it's going to be a lot different in a good way. Dr. Chuck Party, who do you have? 
the team. Oh, I'm, I'm a Brady fan. Is that bad? Okay, okay, that's fine. So, so is Doug. I think he just put he just put out a message saying that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you, you know what? I gotta tell you, I haven't been following the season. I'm much more of a tennis watcher. Uh, I've been a bit busy with the with the, the pandemic, but listen, I am gonna kick my feet up, uh, order some takeout, and uh, watch it with my family on uh, Sunday. Awesome. I'm glad you didn't ask me who's gonna win because I don't even know who the other team is. So, <laughs> <laughs> not either. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I know you guys are tennis fans, but I mean uh, football fans. But uh, I'll be supporting. But again, my thing is tennis. Awesome. <laughs> Dr. Chucker Party, thank you so much. Hopefully next time I talk to you, everybody will be vaccinated and uh, we could talk about, you know, having a alcoholic beverage on a patio. Oh, that would be so amazing, Khaled. We'll, we'll do that right. soon, okay? Take care. Thanks, Take care. Bye -bye. Later.